Yeah, sure. Okay, so today's code session, we're talking about catenaries. We'll get into it, but for the first three minutes or so, uh, we'll see. But uh, we'll be talking about some math, and then we'll uh, code up that math for about 20 minutes, and then uh, we'll we'll do an application. All right. So, and then by the way, just so a lot of uh, the source for the math in this talk comes from a book called A Treatise on Analytical Statistics by Ruth. That was from 1891. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more, there is a lot to know about ropes than, than just what I'm telling you. All right, and so the main thing we're talking about today is a catenary. And so a catenary is the shape of an ideal string hanging uh, from two endpoints. So something, we have two endpoints, and between them, say a string, uh, so we want to know what the shape of that string is. And so when I say ideal, uh, what I mean is two things. So the first thing is that it has no thickness. So that means that it can be modeled well by a curve because a mathematical curve doesn't, doesn't have thickness. Uh, and then two, it means that the tension forces are parallel to the string. Uh, and I'm not really a physics guy, so I don't, I don't know why this uh, in particular means that the string is ideal, but I know that these are the two conditions for it and that from these conditions we get the shape of the catenary. All right, and so there's a little bit of history to this problem. So this problem was first studied uh, by some big names, uh, Galileo, Da Vinci, Hooke. Uh, but we didn't get a solution until 1690. So uh, yeah, 1690, Jacob Bernoulli posed it as a challenge, asking what is the shape of the catenary? And then in 1691, three solutions were published. Uh, and so the solution is this. So the curve that describes the shape of the catenary is this function, f of x equals a times the hyperbolic cosine of x over a, where a uh, is a real number greater than zero. And it's, I mean, to me, that's a little unexpected. Why does the hyperbolic cosine come in? Um, I mean, I, to me, I, I kind of just take it as like a fact of the calculus that it just kind of nicely appears. I, I don't really have an intuition for why that comes up. Uh, and if you haven't seen the hyperbolic cosine, it's also equal to this. So. This is the same thing as e to the x over a plus e to the negative x over a, all of that over 2. So, yeah, every, in everything that I've read, they never say uh, kosh. It, it's always this exponential form. So that's why I think. Uh, that no, it probably wasn't given a name until recently. Oh, well, I'm mean, as recent as, I mean, the book I read, 1890, so kind of recent. Okay, okay so uh, now solving for this shape was a big challenge, and I, I feel like I'm kind of depriving you of of this really cool derivation, but it's actually like. Uh, a good bit of calculus and kind of out of the scope of what we're doing. So we'll take this as a fact that the catenary is, takes this shape, and then we'll, we'll ha we have our own a challenge of our own. And so our challenge is we want to put it into a game. And so what this means is that given two endpoints and a desired length, we want to calculate three things. So we want to calculate uh, the scale of the curve. So the scale is um, that that A parameter. And then we also need to calculate a horizontal shift and a vertical shift. And so these these shifts will allow us to, to uh, shift the curve and into the right into the right place in 3D space. So if we want to put a catenary into our game, we need to solve for these three things of the catenary. Okay. And so what we'll get as a final result, if we solve for these three, three things, is the function f of x equals uh, a times cosh of x minus h. So h, that's our horizontal shift over the scale, and then plus 
V. That's our vertical shift. So these are the three parameters that we want to solve for. Just a, uh, I mean, one could just simulate the tension forces to get a catenary, as I presume the rope in Roblox does, but you have reasons to actually want this function, right? What are they? Uh, yeah, so you could physically simulate this. Um, I mean, to me, it, it's it's nice that we have, okay, well, it, it doesn't turn out to be like a closed form. It actually does require a numerical method. Um, I don't know. I, I, I To me, that solving it this way seems simpler. I guess I, I didn't even think to to simulate it with physics. Well, I'm much happier with what you're doing, obviously, than that solution. But uh, I thought you mentioned that uh, the person who requested this wanted to like measure lengths along the catenary or, or something like that. Oh, for, for which... um, yeah, let me show you. So the reason they, they wanted this, so this is the rope constraint, and it has this visual. So this visual that we're seeing here, this is this is the catenary, and so they, they wanted to be able to uh, place objects along it, so like maybe lights or something. Um, yeah, and so people usually when they want a rope in their game, they usually just use this rope constraint visual. Uh, but if you want to do anything that's not static, uh, then then you would need to do your own math. Okay. So the first thing that we're going to solve for of these three parameters is the scale. And so we have some preliminaries before we do that. And so the first thing is that uh, the derivative of the hyperbolic cosine is the hyperbolic sine. So I've chosen to call that cinch. I've heard it called shine, but I'll, I'll go cinch. And then also the derivative of cinch is cosh. So it's even simpler to remember than just a sine and cosine. All right, and then the second thing that we'll need is the arc length formula for a 1D function, uh, which is this. So the arc length is going to be the integral from on some interval a to b of the square root of 1 plus f prime of x dx. So that's the arc length of a function f of x. And so where this comes from is so let's just take some, some function. And what we're going to do is we're going to approximate its arc length with uh, lines, something like this. So we'll, we'll, we'll add up the lengths of these lines. And then if we make the lengths of these lines smaller and smaller and we have more and more lines, we'll get a better and better approx approximation. Uh, and so I won't derive it fully, but, but we, what we can do is we can look at one of these small lines We'll get it up close. And so we'll call the hypotenuse, we'll call that ds. That means that it's it's a small change in the arc length. And then along the x-axis, we have a small change in uh, x and a small change in y. Okay, and so this quantity here, my hint to you is that that's ds. And so that is um, loosely how you derive that formula. Okay, so here's the setup to our problem. Let's suppose that we have uh, some points. So we'll suppose that we have the point P0 and P1, and that we have a length for our, our rope. Okay, so let's uh, draw that out. And uh, so between these P0 and P1, uh, so we're going to suppose that, actually, I think I'm getting ahead of myself. So between P0 and P1, we can have any any curve. We can have lots of, there's, there's a family of curves that could exist, or a family of catenaries that could exist between uh, these two points. And uh, so given what we know, we want to determine the necessary uh, scaling factor. So we want to pinpoint which of the catenaries in the family of catenaries is the one that we want. Okay, and so we're, let's just look at one of these. So we'll take away these and, right. Uh, and I guess I didn't mention this before, but um, we're gonna suppose that 
the vertical axis, the y-axis, uh, touches the vertex of the catenary. And then it also so happens uh, in the Cauch function that, that that is A. Um, right, so we've placed the y-axis on the vertex and that the vertex is A above the x-axis. And so what this gives us is that the point uh, Y naught using our catenary formula is going to be A times cosh of X naught over A. And Y one is A times cosh of X one over A. And then, uh, Right. The next thing that we do is we subtract y1 from y0. So this gives us the vertical distance between p1 and p0. So this gives us that distance, that's v. And then we also have, right, we already have l. OK, so this isn't too hard to derive, these, these formulas for y0 and y1, and this uh, vertical dif uh, difference uh, but this next step, I, I would never have thought to do, and so this comes straight from from the from the book. And so what we're going to do is uh, take the square root of l squared minus v squared. And so if you, oh, I think I've, I think I've forgotten to mention something. Uh, all right. So what I, what I've forgotten to mention is that we also have a value for l. So we have a value for v in terms of cosh, and we also have the l, which is an, which is our our arc length. And so if we use this arc length formula that we have above, we know that l is going to be integral from x naught to x one of the square root of one plus uh, f prime of x squared. I think I forgot the squared. Yeah, I did forget the squared. And so in our case, our function is cosh where we know the derivative is cinch. So we're going to get this as our integral. And then this simplifies quite nicely. So the- Sorry, Ethan, I, I can't see what you're writing. Maybe it, the screen is frozen for me or something. Are you writing something? Oh, yeah, my, let me try resharing. Okay, I can see Roblox Studio now. I saw your tablet briefly. Yeah. Yep, there it is. Yep, I can see the integral from x0 to x0. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Oh, no, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, right, so what I was saying is that um, the inside of this radical, this 1 plus cinch squared, is actually cosh squared. So I'm kind of skipping over that, but it... It's not too terrible to derive. Uh, and then so we're going to get rid of the radical. So we set the cosh. And then we said before that the derivative of cinch is cosh, so the integral of cosh is cinch. And so it's going to be uh, cinch of x1 minus cinch of x0. Uh, and I actually forgot all of my a terms. So actually, these aren't equalities. It's actually going to be uh, a times cinch of x1 over a minus a times cinch of x naught over a. OK, so we have uh, some known quantities. We have l, we have v. Those are known. But we have them in terms of uh, a, uh, a times cosh and a times cinch. And so we want to solve for a. And so what I was saying earlier is that the, the, the thing that I never would have thought to do is we're going to take the square root of l squared minus v squared. Uh, and this is, again, another lengthy calculation I'll skip over. But what this results with is something uh, a bit simpler. So it's going to be 2a times the cinch of x1 minus x0 over a. And so now what we want to do is we have things that we know. So these are known on the left side. Uh, also, that's known. And then things that we don't know, which is a and then so we want to find an equation where we have some a equals but as it turns out uh this equation is is something called a transcendental equation 
and I don't I don't know much about that. But what what I understand from it is that because this is an, a transcendental equation, that we we can't isolate a, and that we we can't express it in terms of a finite sequence of algebraic operations. So it would be nice to have some a equals equation, but we can't. And so what we have to do is calculate it numerically. All right, and so to do that, we're going to use the bisection method. And Matthias, uh, I believe, yeah, I think Matthias spoke about the bisection method uh, when he spoke about his canon. So I'm not going to explain the method too much, but but the function that we're performing the bisection method on is this. So we, we had this equation above, and all we're going to do is move this over to the right side. And if we move that over to the right side, then what we have is a root finding equal, uh, root finding problem. This is our root finding problem. We want to find uh, where if we plug in a, we get zero. And so this function here, it looks something like this. And what we want is uh, we want the positive root because we want a positive scale. And so I said we're going to use the bisection method. This is just kind of personal preference. I mean, you can use Newton's method, Seekin method, whatever you, whatever you want. I prefer bisection method because it, I mean, as long as your function satisfies the conditions for bisection, you're, there's a pretty good chance that you're going to get convergence. I'm not a big fan of Newton because it just kind of explodes sometimes. Uh, and so the conditions for bisection method is that um, on one side of the root, we need the function to be positive. So on, on this side of the root, we know that it's positive. And then on this side of the root, we know that it's negative. And so the positive side is easy to find because it's at zero, we can see that the, the function is trending in the positive direction. Uh, but a, uh, a negative, or but yeah, a right bound on the root is a bit harder to find. And so the method that I came up with, um, you could solve this probably many different ways, but what I chose to do is to approximate this function as a polynomial. And it turns out polynomials have uh, nice bounds on their roots. Except there's an issue. With, the issue with this is that this function here, um, you can't Taylor expand it about zero. So Taylor expansion would be a method of, of finding an approximate polynomial. And uh, because of this vertical asymptote here, you can't do a Taylor expansion about zero. So what I've chosen to do is do a, a change of variables. And so the, the change of variables is this. So we'll say that uh, z is this this interior part here. So z is going to be x1 minus x0 over 2a. And so our function becomes um, x1 minus x0 over z times the cinch of z minus that square root at the end. And this gives us a much nicer looking function. So it, this one looks something like this. And uh, we're able to Taylor expand it about 0 and uh, find a bound on the root of the Taylor expansion. So we're, it's kind of an approximation on an approximation. All right, yeah, I wrote it. So we're going to do a Taylor expansion of that function and then find an upper bound on it. And so uh, I won't show how to do this, but so this is the, uh, the eighth degree Taylor polynomial about 0. And then uh, there's a, a nice way to get a pretty good root or pretty good bound on the on the positive root, which is which is this. Uh, but we'll kind of gloss over the implementation because it's um, it's a kind of a bit to explain. So anyway, so just to recap, we want to solve for this this scaling parameter a in this function, but we can't because the equation is transcendental. So what we do is we solve numerically. We solve it with a bisection method issue with the bisection method is that we don't have a right bound on the root, and so we approximate it. First, we do a change of variables, and then we approximate it with 
a polynomial, and then we can find a bound on the root. Uh, does anybody have any questions about that? Yeah, um, I was just wondering when you have these situations where you've got a transcendental equation that you need to solve numerically, if you know like the kind of equation, the functions involved beforehand, are there like instances where you can prove that you've got like a positive um, point and a negative point? Like, uh, like you, is it possible to get a formula for those points, or is it always a guessing game? And there's no way to like sees a point above or below the zero line. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> Maybe that was a bit of a tough question, but just curious yeah. if you come across anything like that. So I do know that for this particular function, um, you can you can show that there exists exactly one negative root and one positive root, um, but I couldn't. I didn't come across anything where it was like here is a, a bound on that root. I mean, generically, it seems like you couldn't do something like that. I mean, you'd be able to to then have some idea of whether it had a zero or not. And if I just give you an arbitrary function and ask you if it has a zero, that's not an easy problem. Right. Cool. Thanks. All right, uh, so that was finding the scale. And then there were the two other properties that we wanted to find. We wanted to find a horizontal shift and a vertical shift. And this is uh, the part where our story takes a, a bit of a tragic turn, which is that I actually don't know. <laughs> so I was saying this to Dan, I think, before some people <laughs> arrived, that I did the math for this about four years ago. And so I have I have my old math. So this is the solution apparently. I just genuinely cannot figure out what it means. <laughs> welcome, welcome to mathematics. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. So the the only hint I have. So this one, if you move some stuff around, it, it looks like this. E minus V. Okay, and so this is kind of familiar. So we've seen this before. Oops. We've seen this. And then this looks like... Um, I think your tablet might have frozen up again. Oh. Oh, no. No, I can, I can see a mouse. I just, that bracket over on the right-hand side just didn't close. Oh, okay. Yeah, now, now, it's, now it's back. Yeah, I can see. Yeah, I, did, I couldn't see okay, the cool. Kosh line below. Yeah. Yeah, I think it just happens anytime my computer goes to sleep. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. So, anyway, just it, parts of this formula look familiar, but I just cannot make sense of it. The only thing I, I've made a little bit of sense is that so what it's trying to do is is shift the origin uh, such that p naught is at the origin, and then uh, the vertex is uh, to the to the right of it. Oh, yeah. I think. Probably if you expand out the the hyperbolic functions and multiply through by an exponential, you'll get a quadratic. And maybe maybe these these formulas look like what you'd probably get if you apply the uh, Yeah, th I mean that that's the, that's where the logarithm has to have come from, right? So you must have this formula with the square root of L squared minus V squared. You've got a hyperbolic function somewhere. You multiply it through by the exponential, and then one of the the e to the minus x becomes one. The e to the x becomes e to the two x. You think about that as e to the x squared. Then solve the quadratic. Uh, maybe. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. This is why you gotta you gotta comment your math, not just your code. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, yeah. If you look back at the old code. Actually, maybe I, maybe I w won't say that, but it's it's like it's under a comment that's pretty profane, and I. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, it can stay as an exercise for the viewer. <laughs> yeah. 
All right, so that concludes the math section. How do we do on time? I think, okay, 27 minutes, that was, that was pretty accurate. All right, so now what we're gonna do, let me switch tabs, is we're gonna, we're gonna code it. All right, so let me insert a script. Dumb question. These P0 and P1s, these are billboard GUIs or what are they? Oh yeah, you're exactly right. I think, yeah, they're billboard GUIs. All right, so let's start with some just boilerplate. So we'll make a catenary object. And then one of the methods we want to have is uh, solve position. And that's going to take the parameter t. Uh, t is a number from 0 to 1. So when t is at 0, it's like if you've done linear interpolation. When t is at 0, we want it to be at p0. And when t is at 1, we want it to be at uh, p1. And let's see. So the catenary. The new function is going to take in three things. Our three parameters were p naught, p one, and then a length. And then we're going to return an object, so we'll uh, we'll leave it empty for now. We're going to return a, a catenary object. Okay, so if we look at is my yes. What do we have? So when we went about solving this, the first thing we did was we calculated. Uh, v, so that's the difference between uh, the heights of P1 and P0. So we'll call the vertical distance, we'll say uh, V dist is P1.y minus P0.y. Um, and then we also have length, so uh, that's just a given, we have length. And then what we did to solve for our scale is that our scale uh, First, we solve for the for the root of that of that function, so we'll uh, use a, a different function for that. And then what we did is we did a reverse change of variables. So the scale is going to be the the what is it? Oh, I'm missing something. We also need the horizontal distance. And so in in 2D, the horizontal distance is just going to be uh, p one dot x minus p p naught dot x. Um, the trouble with doing this is that we're actually working in, in 3D and not 2D. And so uh, the x distance isn't isn't just comparing the x coordinates. And so actually what we need to do is, is, is define our own x axis. So if you look at these visuals here, what we're going to need to do is define our own x axis, x -axis that points from p0 to p1. And then our y axis will just use the normal y-axis. And so in doing this, we, we can continue to use our 2D math, uh, but but in 3D. So we've just defined our own xy plane as well. And so, right, so the, this v dist we just defined is the difference in the heights. And then this h dist is uh, the difference along our new x-axis. And so in just a moment in the code, what I'm, I'm going to call this this blue vector, I'm going to call that ground. So ground is this blue vector from P0 to P1 without where the y component is 0. And then the, the magnitude of ground is going to be uh, h dist. OK, so we have that, that ground vector. And so that's pointing from P0 to P1, except the y component is 0. And then so our, our x-axis is going to be the ground vector uh, but but unitized, so it's just length one. And then the, the horizontal distance is going to be the magnitude of the ground vector. One second, let me plug in my laptop. Okay, right, and then so as I was saying, uh, the scale is going to be the horizontal distance over twice the root. And then we have to go in and solve for the, the root of that function. So let's do that now. 
Wait, so if you multiply vector threes, it just does component-wise multiplication? Yeah, actually that's, I multiplied this wrong, but you're exactly right. That's wild, okay. <laughs> Okay, and so for our numerical root solver, we're going to have as input the horizontal distance, the vertical distance, and the length. So let's give it that. And then the function whose root we're finding is uh, this function. So it was, I've just disconnected my tablet, so I, I can't show you, but it was this. It was a horizontal distance times right, the cinch of z over z, and then minus the square root of length squared minus the vertical distance squared, okay. Uh, and I'm, we're actually gonna reuse this constant again, so I'm, I'm just gonna give it a variable. We'll just say it's c. Okay, so that's the function whose root we're finding. And so now we're going to perform the bisection method. And let's define some maximum amount of iterations. So I just kind of arbitrarily chosen 32. And then for the lower bound, we said that the lower bound was a zero because we know the function is always going to be negative at zero. And then the upper bound is this is when we kind of went off the rails and we did a, a Taylor expansion and then we, we solved for the upper bound on the Taylor expansion. Uh, so we'll use another function for that. So we'll do, we'll call it solve root of the upper, does that make sense? Yeah, solve root upper bound. Uh, and then I, I just kind of, I glossed over what the actual formula was, so I'll just, type it in and we'll take it as a given. Just wanted to say that until you were discussing this on Discord, I'd never looked at this problem of finding an upper bound for a zero from the coefficients of a Taylor series expansion. This is really a little oh, co really? cool okay. piece of math. So I'm glad you got into this. Yeah, I, I was surprised to find that there was actually, that it was possible. Um, it worked out quite nice. I had actually, so the reason I had, I had originally put, uh, mentioned it in the off-topic channels because I, I assumed that like being a, an algebraic, what do, you, what do you call yourself, a ge algebraic geometer, I assumed that you would actually uh, yeah, we don't, know we, this. <laughs> we don't actually compute things, man. We just... Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> we just prove things exist. <laughs> right, so that was, uh, that's our approximation. Actually, I have a Desmos graph up. Um, yeah, this was the original function, and then we do a change of a variable, and it looks like this. And then in, this is um, the Taylor approximation. So if I click between the purple and the blue, it, they look like the exact same thing. So it, it's a really good approximation. Um, oh, and then, you know, I should have done this. I should have uh, also put in the, the bound, so. So the, the the upper bound we find is, is actually pretty good. So having having a, a, a interval of ten for a bisection method is actually pretty great. So if we do our, our maximum iterations, uh, so if we start with ten, so after thirty two iterations, the size of our interval is going to be really really small. And so we're, I mean, I would say we're pretty much guaranteed convergence. And this, uh, this bound of like 10 is, is really good compared to other ones I found, which were like a million or something. I think I named this function wrong, yeah. All right, so that's our approximation for the upper bound of the root, and then we'll actually do the bisection. So for our iterations, what we do for bisection is we first find the midpoint between the lower and the upper bounds, and then we evaluate the function at that midpoint. And then what we do is, is we check, so is this midpoint 
pretty close to zero because we want the root to be at zero. So if this is less than some small number, then we'll say, okay, that's good enough. So if the value is close to zero, we'll return mid as the root. Otherwise, uh, we, we update our, our upper and lower bounds. And so, right, so if, actually, it's, I'm going to butcher the explanation. I, uh, you can look at Matt Matthias's talk for this. We just shrink our interval and then, and then search again. And then if we if we get to the end, that means that we, we fail to converge. I mean, it's kind of unlikely, I'd say, and I've actually never hit a case where it fails to converge. Uh, but if we do, then we'll just return halfway, the lower and upper is kind of a good enough. All right, so that is the numerical solution for this root, which we can then use to solve for the scale. And I think at this point we should uh, visualize what we have so far. So let's just make an object out of this. Uh, where else we need the length? And what else do we need? We're gonna need the ground vector, the x-axis, and the scale. So then when we go to solve the position, what, okay, we're actually gonna need a bunch of these things again, so I'll just uh, define these. Okay, and so our, our x that we're inputting is going to be uh, t times the ground. So I said earlier when I was like trying to make sense of the, uh, the horizontal and vertical shifts that I solved four years ago, uh, I had said that we're going to use p naught as our origin. And so that, that's what's happening here with, with the x that we input. So when t is 0, uh, x is going to be 0. And when t is 1, we're going to be at... Um, when t is one, we're going to be at, at this this point here. All right, and then so y, now we're going to plug it into our catenary equation, and it's going to be scale times cosh of x over scale, and then we're, we're missing our shifts. We'll, we'll go back for that, All right? And then so the, the actual position of this is going to be, so I'd said, so p naught is the origin, and then along the x-axis, we're going to move uh, x units. And then along our y-axis, we're going to move y units. Right, OK, so now let's test this. Right, uh, so I'll, as I usually do, I'll import gizmo so we can uh, create some visuals. So where did I put this? Replicate storage.gizmo. And then on heartbeat, so we're going to need our p naught. So that's going to be uh, the the part named p naught will take its position, and then for p one we'll take the position of um, part one, and then for the length of the rope, uh, we'll take the length of the rope constraint. So that's going to be uh, p naught rope constraint uh, length. Right, and then so we'll construct our catenary. So we'll do catenary dot new. And we'll give it these three parameters, and then we'll uh, draw some points along the along the catenary. Actually, let me not inline twenty. Let's just make that a variable real quick. All right. So we should get something vaguely similar to, vaguely close to a solution. Or maybe not. Well, yeah, ground dot magnitude, maybe. E hmm. Ground. Ground is a vector. 
Yeah, you might be right about that. Yeah, so it might be the horizontal distance. Which is what you said, the, the magnitude of ground, so... Oh, well. Hmm. I'm looking at my working code, and... Okay, so this, this actually is just the working code. We'll just cheat a little. Um... Yeah, ground. Ground is a vector. That's bizarre. I don't I actually tell you know why that works, because you're right, it should be a number. Maybe it's the scary multiplication of vectors. <laughs> is that 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 really is cool, right? Uh, I don't know. I never did that before. Oh, the the that, time is the vector. That's gonna be a vector, right? Yeah, yeah. That should. Yeah, I'm very confused now. <laughs> this is interesting. Because t, that's also. I mean, what do we pass to solve position? We pass. Uh, yeah, this is just a number. Is multiplication by a scalar and a vector not commutative? Does it cast it to a scalar when you multiply a vector on the left with a scalar? Oh. Because the multiplication is the other way around in your current code. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> point. My guess would be no. <laughs> I bet you $100. <laughs> <laughs> oh damn! Uh, <laughs> I take it back. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, can I have the hundred dollars? <laughs> hey, let me pass it. H dist. Oh, okay. Um. Yeah, yeah, no, this is this is to be expected though, because we haven't put in our, our horizontal and vertical shifts yet. Uh okay. But that this is good. We're we're almost there. Actually, how am I doing on time? Okay, we might actually I think we can finish it up in the next few minutes. Or at least the math part, and then we'll try to get to an application real quick. So the horizontal and vertical shift uh yeah, we'll just take these as fact. But I'm I'm Curious what what you said, Dan. I'm actually I'm gonna look into that more because I do want a a satisfying solution to this. So right, there's that. And then the vertical shift is this. Yes, and then here, right, so then here's where, where we apply the horizontal shift, and at the end we add the vertical shift, and then hopefully we should get uh, a rope. Or almost. I think I have like a, I must have like an, a divide by two or something where I shouldn't, because that's like almost there.
Seems like it has to be the scale, not the shift. But that's... I think this is the same thing. Mm. I mean, it's the... it's the... A, isn't it? I don't know that what that turned yeah, into. Yeah, A is the scale. Right. That's bizarre. It's not, no, that, that's correct, that divide by two. Oh, is it? Oh, oh, I never fixed this. Oh, yeah. So the whole point I was actually, no, I did fix it. I was just overriding H disk. So I, I have H disk up here. Yeah, okay. All right. Very good. And then the only thing, the only difference between what I'm showing the demo and what we've just done is that the demo, oh, okay. Now you can't really see it. Uh, yeah, the demo has them equally spaced. Uh, maybe we'll. I mean, we have ten minutes left, so let's uh, let's get into an application. And so the application I was thinking of um, is, you ever seen those like what what are they? Um, like the the triangle wedges. Like, let me just look up a photo. Triangle wedge. No triangle string banner yeah these things <laughs> uh -huh. yeah i figure we just make one of those i mean so it's probably not like physically accurate because once you put the weight of the flags on it, it my guess is it's no longer precisely a catenary although catenary is really a an approximation to begin with so all right so this is we'll try this it's called bunting by the way Oh, it's called what? Bunting. Bunting? Oh. <laughs> You're braver than me Googling random terms in a live stream. But... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, right, so I... Oh, no, I called it a pennant. Okay. That, I think that's actually something different. Right, so what we're going to try to do is, so first we'll we'll do something simple as we'll just place it, we'll we'll clone, right? We'll we'll clone a bunting and then we'll just place it somewhere along the curve. Bunting is referring to the entire like decoration on the string. I, th I think okay. you would still call it a flag. Okay, for individual I'm things. <laughs> Just gonna give up. It's a wedge. See what that gives us. Oh God! <laughs> Every heartbeat. <laughs> yeah. And I also didn't anchor it. Oh, so that means it's not going to live update. All right. Well, okay. Well, getting that to work is kind of obnoxious. We'll just be happy if it works once. Okay, that's, uh, oh, so something we're going to need to get a, a, a full C-frame. So right now, we only have a position of a C-frame. And then we also need uh, a tangent, a normal, and a, a binormal vector to get a full C-frame. So the tangent, okay, well, we know the tangent. That's going to be the, 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 the derivative, which is just cinch. And then the normal, or a normal vector is going to be, um perpendicular to so if, if we have a how can i show this uh oh right so we can have 
a normal vector that, that's perpendicular to this plane here. So perpendicular to the y-axis and x-axis. And then for a bivector, we can just cross those two. So let's give that a go. It's the C-frame math part of the live stream. You get $5 <laughs> if you can get it right the first time. <laughs> <laughs> I will see. All right, I'll take you up on that. So let's solve. So let's see if we solve, solve uh, what is it, the velocity. Yeah, that's right. Right. Okay. So what's the derivative of this? Oh, that's not what I want to do. It should just be a, a just place replace stint with cosh. Oh, but we need a wait, we need a number. Okay, so then I think we're we're just returning y. Okay, so that should be our tangent. So our tangent is going to be, so our position is uh, solving the position, and our tangent is going to be. Oh, what if I have I indented something wrong? It's just because of the run service thing. You took that away. Oh, okay. So it's confused. And then, right, so that's the position, and then the tangent, or no, no, we need that to be a vector, that's right, so why? Ah, yeah, okay, I can't think of this in my head right now, how this would work. All right, this might, this might not end up working, this, this example. No, but we don't want, it might just be this. You can just solve position for two nearby things and take the difference. Yeah, that's that's a safer way to go it to do it. So Okay, and then a normal vector is going to be uh we need Right, okay, we're just gonna, that should work, right? So we want a cross product of the x-axis and the y, oh yeah, that's right, yeah, we need an x cross, so we're gonna cross the x-axis with the y-axis. And then the my normal is going to be uh, tangent cross normal, I believe. So then let's give this to a C frame. And then we'll give it uh, the the from matrix constructor. So this takes in a, a position in three vectors. And I can all, I can never remember which order the vectors go in. I will right, we'll just pick one. So we'll do tangent, normal, and binormal. Right, let's see how that goes. Oh, it's a fortune on the line here. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> it's like 5,000 Robux, right? <laughs> That's pretty good. I think that worked. I mean, not quite, but... Wait, 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 wait. Weren't they supposed to hang down like those pictures? Well, yeah, I okay, guess what I mean. It, I'm, I'm impressed that any of that worked. <laughs> I see. So, all right. It, it probably has to do with the order of... of these but we're just going to rotate it so uh yeah we'll just make a guess okay so we have to rotate that by pi and then on another axis we'll rotate by pi over two
Nope. Ta -da, uh. <laughs> oh yeah, I was. Yeah, my brain didn't realize that. Yeah, that's that's right. Okay. So we just need a few less. Looks a bit more dangerous than those pictures on Google Images. But... <laughs> yeah. Okay, let's, uh... Make it a bit, a bit larger. And yeah, we can also give so just give him a random uh, color. Okay. <laughs> All right. I say that's we're up on time, so I say it's good enough. That looks great. <laughs> Very festive. Uh, thanks a lot, Ethan. Are there any quick questions?